cell-based coagulation. Welcome to another Talk Talk episode. Here we'll be continuing our series of episodes on secondary hemostasis, and we'll present the cell-based model of coagulation. As seen in the first episode, the starting point of coagulation is vascular injury, with platelets rapidly accumulating at the site of injury. At the same time, blood comes into contact with smooth muscle cells and fibroblasts present in the vessel wall. These cells express factor three, a membrane protein, on the cell surface. Because factor three is present in the tissue surrounding the vessel, it's also termed tissue factor. In an intact blood vessel, tissue factor is separated from other clotting factors by the endothelium to prevent coagulation. When the endothelium is injured, tissue factor is exposed and forms a complex with factor seven, resulting in activated factor seven. The complex of factor three and activated factor seven then activates factor 10. Subsequently, Factor 10 cleaves factor 2, also called prothrombin, to factor 2A, also called thrombin. So, as a comparison, let's go back to the coagulation cascade. The events described so far are part of the extrinsic pathway. However, in contrast to the cascade model, cell-based coagulation doesn't lead to fibrin cleavage at this stage. Until this point, thrombin forms slowly. However, the small amount of thrombin remains insufficient to produce adequate amounts of fibrin. Yet, this small amount of thrombin is very important and can be used to activate factors in the intrinsic pathway. Accordingly, the generated thrombin is referred to as the spark. The goal of this thrombin spark is to initiate a feedback loop between the extrinsic and intrinsic pathways, which we'll take a closer look at in a moment. But first, let's discuss the special features of the cell based model. In contrast to the cascade model, Clotting factors don't only react with one another in blood, but specifically on the cell membrane surface, which is the central location of coagulation in the cell-based model. Factors 3, 7, 10, and 2 are present on the surface of smooth muscle cells and fibroblasts. The question that arises at this stage is how can coagulation shift from the surface of these cells to the surface of platelets? Factor 10A can't be involved because it's rapidly inactivated when away from the cell membrane. Therefore, thrombin adopts the role of the mediator as it's able to reach the platelet surface. Let's explore this in more detail. Thrombin has several functions on the platelet surface. However, we won't be presenting all of them in this episode. For the time being, it's important to just remember the two following functions. Thrombin can bind to platelets via the receptor for von Willebrand factor. Yes, that's right. It's the same receptor that mediates platelet adhesion. By binding to the receptor for von Willebrand factor, thrombin supports platelet activation. Therefore, it prepares the platelet membrane for coagulation by initiating the flip of membrane lipids from the inner to the outer layer of the membrane. The second important task of thrombin is the activation of other clotting factors. Thrombin initially activates factors 11, 8, and 5, therefore establishing a link to the intrinsic pathway. Before we take a look at how coagulation further proceeds, let's have a closer look at factor 8. In plasma, factor 8 is bound to von Willebrand factor. Once factor 8 is activated by thrombin, it results in the release of von Willebrand factor, which, in turn, binds to the receptor for von Willebrand factor and facilitates platelet adhesion. As shown here, both processes occur in the immediate vicinity of one another on the platelet surface. This is a very good example that demonstrates how primary and secondary hemostasis are closely linked. Now, back to the coagulation process. Up until this stage, we've mentioned that a small amount of thrombin is generated, which activates factors 11, 8, and 5. Activated factor 11 subsequently activates factor 9, which then forms a complex with factor 8. This complex, comprising factors 9 and 8, activates factor 10. This brings us back to the next phase of the cell-based model, which is comparable to the common pathway model of the coagulation cascade. The following aspect is very important for understanding in vivo coagulation. Factor 10 can be activated by two different complexes, either by factors 3 and 7 or by factors 9 and 8. These complexes are termed 10 aces, which stems from 10 for the substrate factor they activate and the suffix ace, which is generally used for enzymes. In reference to the pathways of the cascade model, they are also termed extrinsic and intrinsic 10 aces. Don't worry if things appear a little complicated. It's actually quite easy. 
Extrinsic tenase contains factors 3 and 7 and is present on smooth muscle cells and fibroblasts of the vessel wall. Intrinsic tenase contains factors 9 and 8 and is present on the platelet's surface. So why is this absolutely crucial? Intrinsic tenase is approximately 50 times more effective in activating factor 10 than extrinsic tenase. After the generation of small amounts of thrombin and subsequent activation of intrinsic tenase, a large amount of factor 10 is activated. Factor 10 then binds to activated factor 5. By the way, factor 5 has been transported to the site by platelets, is released upon their activation, and functions as a cofactor for the conversion of prothrombin to thrombin. The binding of factor 5 to factor 10 results in increased factor 10 activity by 250 to 1,000 fold. This shows the importance of initial activation of factors such as factor 5 by the thrombin spark, which helps to get coagulation going. Now, prothrombin is rapidly converted to active thrombin. To relate this to the cascade model, the factors that are assigned to the intrinsic pathway are responsible for generating most of the thrombin, with over 95% of the total amount of thrombin. This leads to a decisive step in the coagulation process. Fibrinogen is cleaved to fibrin, known as activated factor 1. The fibrin molecules then assemble into fibrin strands. In the final step, thrombin also activates factor 13, which crosslinks individual fibrin strands into a stable fibrin network. Red blood cells are also caught in the fibrin network, which is why the newly formed thrombus is also termed red thrombus. Secondary hemostasis, according to the cell-based model, is now complete. Please note that we haven't mentioned all of the existing interactions between clotting factors. It's easy to see that coagulation is a very complex process with sometimes opposing demands. On the one hand, it must always be ready to rapidly stop bleeding. On the other hand, false activation needs to be prevented in the absence of a wound by negative interactions. So, in order to find the right balance between complexity and comprehensibility, we've concentrated on the most important steps in this description and tried to introduce them as straightforward as possible. Yet, coagulation doesn't follow a linear pattern, as many processes run in parallel and can be stimulated or inhibited by feedback loops. At this stage, we'd like to supplement one of the links. Factor 7 not only activates factor 10 and initiates the generation of small amounts of thrombin, but also directly activates factor 9. This occurs to a lesser extent than factor 10 activation, but through the link between factors 7 and 9, the body creates a link between the intrinsic and extrinsic systems and ensures that coagulation starts promptly. This reinforcement loop is a positive feedback loop and is also termed the Jasso loop after its discoverer. So, were you able to understand everything until now? If yes, well done. If you haven't, don't worry. We'll be summarizing everything now, and things will become much clearer. Okay, let's go. Coagulation is classically divided into the extrinsic and intrinsic pathways, which both run into a common pathway. The newer cell-based model attempts to describe how the sequence of events occur under physiological conditions. The main difference is that the cell-based model of coagulation doesn't separate the two pathways, but describes several stages in which coagulation proceeds. After endothelial injury, blood comes into contact with tissue factor and coagulation is activated. Extrinsic tenases activate factor 10 and initiate the generation of small amounts of thrombin. The thrombin generated plays a key role because it activates platelets and factors 11, 8, and 5 on the platelet surface. Intrinsic tenases are subsequently formed on the platelet surface, which strongly activate factor 10. Factor 10 forms prothrombinase complexes with factor 5. The name of this complex comes from its ability to cleave prothrombin to thrombin. To understand this model, it's important to note that most of the thrombin is generated by the prothrombinase complex. In the final step of the cascade, fibrin is formed, which is cross-linked by factor 13. Maybe all of these steps can be better remembered if you refer to them by their three phases. These are termed initiation, amplification, and propagation. Initiation is similar to the extrinsic pathway and occurs on the cells of the vascular wall. Amplification takes place when small amounts of thrombin initiate the intrinsic system on platelets. During propagation, numerous tenase and prothrombin complexes assemble on the platelet surface. When these complexes accumulate, large amounts of thrombin and fibrin form, resulting in a thrombin burst. Thrombin, therefore, plays a double role in this coagulation model, 
acting as a spark in the initiation phase and a burst in the propagation phase. This double role is made possible by the fact that coagulation occurs on the surface of various cells. Therefore, this aspect is worth focusing on in our next Chalk Talk episode. We'll take a detailed look there at how clotting factors bind to the cell surface and examine how this mechanism can be used in coagulation tests.